How about if you've been shut off for a month? What do you think happens? The answer is I don't really know. I think some of the time you might get restored. I think some of the time you might not get it restored. So we have been raising this issue for about the last year and a half with the department. What, is, what does fail to restore mean? I mean, it seems to mean you've got to turn it back on, right? Is it forever? What if you moved to Texas for a year and somehow came back to the very same address and the service has been off, apartment vacant for a year? You're not going to get turned back on. I don't, even I don't suggest that. Um, I think what the department is going to do, and you heard it here first, um, I think what the department's going to do is tell the companies, um, if you don't honor that right to restore for three months after the termination, we, the department, may intervene, kind of signaling, you know what, restore them even if they've been off for as long as three months. And if you don't do that, the department may order you to do that. This is not, I don't think, going to come out as an order, so it's still going to be a little murky. But I think the benchmark you should use is if your client has been off even as long as three months and they have a serious illness, you can get it restored. And I don't know about your own experience, but I'm always amazed some of our clients live without utility service for that long. The gas gets shut off in the spring, and maybe it's both the heat and the cooking, but you don't need the heat in the summer, and you figure out some way to plug in a burner, an electric thing, and you get by without your gas for the whole summer, right? I know that I've seen that. Um, so it might work. And, and I, I think this is really important news because it means even those folks who've been off for a long period of time, we may have a way to get them back on. Okay, so I will get to financial hardship unless there's any questions about anything else I said on serious illness. I, I, I know the question you're asking. Oh, I do. It comes up all the time. Um, I, I think the news is bad on this one. Let me restate it so it's a scenario everyone's familiar with. You probably have all dealt with the situation. Um, either you're working with a client who's been in shelter for a long period of time, or some other reason they've been without utility service, they're moving to a new address. Um, do they get the service on because they have an infant or a, a serious illness? The answer seems to be no in the mind of the department. And the legal argument, which I don't necessarily agree with, runs something like this. If we were to take the time to read the regs word for word, it would appear that you have to be a customer of the company to assert these rights. And that actually gets to the three months on serious illness. The department's kind of saying, you know what? Up to three months, you're still a customer of some kind. But when you're moving to a new address, the department's position is, you're not a customer. You are an applicant for service. So the rights don't apply. So you don't get service on at the new address because you have an infant, and you don't get it on at the new address because you have a serious illness. There is one situation, though, I do want to mention because I think the practice is decent at the department. In my experience, if we are lucky enough to catch a client before they move, if they have serious illness at this address and you know they're going to move, the serious illness protection or infant protection is kind of portable. You kind of tell the company, I'm moving, I want to get service on at that address. The department's theory there seems to be you're a customer when you're asserting that right. You shouldn't lose that protection because you're moving from one address to another. Now, that's almost directly contrary to the rule, but when you're moving from shelter into that new apartment, you don't have that right. But if you can plan ahead, if you're working with a client who's housed and has a protection, you should tell the company before you move that you want to move with that protection. I think you might have to go to the consumer division on that one. This is not written in the rules anywhere, but the consumer division seems sympath more sympathetic to that one than I'm coming out of shelter and I have an infant, why don't I get service? Or I'm coming out of shelter and I have a serious illness, why, why don't I get service? So it's not good news, but does that at least tell you what the rules are? Um, the yellow sheet shows you that uh, for serious illness, you not only need to prove serious illness, and, and obviously I've talked about that a lot, but you need to demonstrate financial hardship. And if you look at the yellow sheet, you'll see that three of the four protections require financial hardship. Serious illness, winter moratorium, infant. Uh, proving financial hardship is the same for all three. The definition of financial hardship is in the book. The definitions start on page 63. They're alphabetical, so obviously you flip onto page 64. Financial hardship, again, it's alphabetical on page 64. Financial hardship shall exist when a customer is unable to pay an overdue bill 
and such customer meets income eligibility requirements for the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program. Um, or the director of the consumer division determines that such a finding is warranted. So let me turn that into simpler English. Eligibility for the Low Income Home Energy Assistance Program is 60% of median income this year. That stuff's available on various websites, uh, the DHCD website in particular. Um, ABCD has it because they run fuel assistance. It's about $54,000 for a family of four. If it was a family of 12, because I actually had one of those the other day, it's somewhere around $92,000 a year. Obviously, that doesn't come up a lot. So the eligibility for financial hardship protection is relatively high compared to a lot of the other income-tested programs you deal with. You know, it's higher than SNAP. It's higher than TAFDC. Um, so if you're at that level or below, you can just fill out a form and you kind of automatically qualify. A company has to protect you as financial hardship if you are below the income limit for fuel assistance. However, you could actually ask the department, the consumer division, to say you have a financial hardship. If you're somewhat above that, there's no rule on this, but if you read those words, it says, or in the discretion of the consumer division, the head says you have a financial hardship. Um, sometimes this comes up with people who have extraordinary medical bills, or somebody just lost a job, so they still have to pay the mortgage, um, but they don't have that much income and they can't afford it. So. Um, Sometimes the DPU will certify it. For most of the folks we're dealing with, they're going to be below 60% of median, so you don't have to worry about it. It's automatic. The forms for financial hardship are in the book. So I'm going to use the table of contents on Roman page 8. It tells me the financial hardship forms are on page 89. So we looked at some of these already. Um, for every company that we could find their financial hardship form on file, we printed it in the book. Um, as far as we know, financial hardship forms, the companies do not post on the web, but I do want to tell you this. There have been times where the companies will give advocates a hard time getting a financial hardship form, which I find totally amazing, because it's a required piece of paper to work with the client to assert the various protections. Um, the companies say things like, oh, we want the customer to call us. Um, but it seems to me you don't have to call the company to get a financial hardship form and talk to a customer service rep. And so I've raised it with, with the consumer division. Again, another example of going to the consumer division. They completely agreed. They called up the company and said, give a financial hardship form to anybody who asks. So, you know, this book was printed about two years ago. The forms might have changed a bit. Um, so I would suggest you, you call the company and ask them for a sample financial hardship form. You don't have to use an original, as far as I know, so you could photocopy it to your heart's content and have a stack available in your office. Um, I'm assuming most of you deal with NGRID and NSTAR and probably not other companies, so if you get two pieces of paper, you'll have all the financial hardship forms you need. Um, I also don't think there's anything so outdated against the NSTAR and NGRID forms that are already in the book. Um, except that the address may have changed uh, for, uh, for some of the companies. So um, you need to fill out a financial hardship form. Worth knowing that financial hardship forms technically under the regs are only good for 90 days. Serious illness rules, as I told you, just got better. The serious illness letters are, be are good for a longer period of time. So in theory, you may have to put in, turn in several financial hardship forms in the same period of time. You'll have to turn in one serious illness letter. Uh, a chronic serious illness letter is good for 180 days. The financial hardship form only 90. You may have to send the financial hardship form in twice. I don't know much about company practice. I don't know if they play hardball and say, oh, you're serious, illness letter's still good, but the financial hardship form expired. I, I just don't know. So if you wanted to be cautious, you would have a little tickler that would get the other financial hardship form in. Um, OK, I think I've covered serious illness. I spend so much time on this because more than anything else, uh, this is the consumer right in Massachusetts that helps more of the clients who are, who are calling me up in terms of uh, protecting the service or getting terminated service restored. So any questions on financial hardship? Okay, it gets easier after this.